Because you listen to this show, I'm going to assume that, like me, you're a person who's fascinated by scientific and philosophical questions. So I wanted to tell you about another show I've discovered recently, the addictive, eye-opening, mind-bending podcast series, The End of the World with Josh Clark. Josh Clark is co-host of the absorbing Stuff You Should Know podcast. And for The End of the World, he dives into existential risks, ways we humans might accidentally wipe ourselves out with the same technology we're developing now in the hope that it will make a bright future for us. For example, how a haphazard physics experiment could end the universe, or why artificial intelligence could take control of the world, or how an artificially mutated virus could escape a lab and create a global pandemic. This is serious stuff for sure, but the end of the world delivers the fascinating science behind existential risks through an immersive experience with a beautiful original score and cinematic sound design that takes you from a spacecraft trying to navigate interstellar space to deep inside your body to the far future where humans have evolved into a post-biological species who live in digital form. The End of the World with Josh Clark is waiting to take you on an adventure. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, or wherever you get your podcasts. Why not listen to all 10 episodes now and join the conversation on social media with hashtag EOTW Josh Clark. Welcome to Future Makers, your invitation to cutting-edge debates on our changing society with leading researchers at the University of Oxford. Our first series is all about artificial intelligence. I'm Peter Milliken, Professor of Philosophy. Thank you for joining us here in the Thomas Hobbes Room at Hartford College. Today, in the penultimate episode of Series 1, we're looking at the development of AI across the globe. China has set itself the challenge of becoming the world's primary innovation centre by 2030, a move forecast to generate a 26% boost in GDP from AI-related benefits alone. But how realistic is this aim? And in what ways can we learn from what China's doing? With me to discuss this are Mike Wooldridge, head of Oxford's Department of Computer Science, Xiaorong Ding, a postdoctoral researcher who studied and worked at several of China's leading universities and companies, and Sophie Charlotte Fisher, a visiting researcher at the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford and working on a doctorate at ETH Zurich focusing on the development of AI in China and the USA. Welcome to you all. Great to be Thanks here. Thanks for having us. Nice to be here. Xiaorong, could you set the scene for us? What is it that China is hoping to achieve by 2030? China seeks to become the leader in most of the area, from the base, from the serial to the application, to the technology and to the applications. Usually, the central government they release the plan, and most of the local governments, like the province, some of central cities like the Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, they have their uh, they following the plan to would set their own subset plans to support the central plans. Uh, they would attract uh, global and local talent to build the ecosystem in the local area. Sophie Charlotte, um, what do you think about this plan? Well, I think it's certainly a very ambitious plan that uh, the Chinese State Council has uh, published uh, last year. And I think it's important to situate this in the broader context of Chinese goals when it comes to science and technology. Generally, China is aiming at becoming an innovative nation and a global powerhouse for science and technology. And this artificial intelligence plan is certainly one aspect of it. And maybe we can go a bit more into detail about why they're actually setting themselves these goals. If we look at previous plans, um, we do see, for example, in the 2006 National Medium and Long-Term Plan for the Development of Science and Technology, that China aims to become an innovative nation by 2020 already and a global scientific powerhouse by 2050. 
So this is a across the whole area of science. This is across is the whole area, exactly. And this uh, was already a goal which was uh, stated in this plan by two th in 2006. But more recently, um, for example, last year in October 2017, Chinese President Xi Jinping reiterated in his report to the 19th Party Congress his dream for China to become a science and technology superpower. So in line with these goals that were set earlier. And these goals are also reflected in the current uh, five-year plan, the 13th five-year plan, uh, which covers the time period from 2016 to 2020. And in this plan, artificial intelligence already plays a role and it's uh, considered as the sixth of uh, in total 69 priorities that the Chinese government has. So yeah, I think it's important to see that this plan by the State Council that was published last year, it's not the first time that the government actually started to think about artificial intelligence, but that this was already a sort of in previous plans a prominent goal. And have these previous plans actually been delivering? What we can say about this artificial intelligence plan that was published last year is that this really is the signal and a bundling of all these prior plans. So it really signals the resolve of the Chinese government to make this a priority, which is certainly very important in order to really implement the goals that uh, Xiaorong was talking uh, about before. So I think now we can really observe what is happening in the time up to 2030 and maybe from there judge again whether China has actually delivered on these goals that it set itself. You said that AI was number six out of 69 priorities. Now, if I heard that some plan in Britain was number six priority of the government, I'd be rather sceptical as to whether much is going to happen. But I, my guess is that in China, it might be a little bit different. I mean, w what are the top five priorities? How big is number six? With the uh, Next Generation Artificial Intelligence Development Plan from last year, the prioritization has clearly changed. So now AI is really considered as the transformative technology that can help China to meet its GDP targets and also to, for example, transform the military and to play a huge role when it comes to uh, social governance in China. So I would say we shouldn't be too focused on this number six in the last five-year plan, but we should really recognize that these priorities might also have changed and that AI has become a lot more more important over the last two years. So it's moving up and up. It's exactly, yes. Mike, historically, how big a role has China played in AI? I've been an AI researcher for 30 years, started my PhD in 1989. And at that time, I think it's probably fair to say that there was really no Chinese presence. Here's some statistics. Um, when I started my PhD, there was one conference that was the coolest place to publish in AI, and it's called Triple AI, and it, it was originally the American Association for AI. When this conference started in 1980, there were no Chinese papers at all. I mean, there was not a single paper from China in the, in, in the conference. If you go forward to 1998, which happens to be the first year that I published there, there was one paper from China and it was from Hong Kong. And of course, Hong Kong had just transitioned back to Chinese rule one year before that. This year, there were more Chinese papers than US papers for the first time. And that trajectory has just been astonishing. I mean, witnessing that as somebody that's part of this community, that's seeing the dynamics of science and the areas that become fashionable and then go out of fashion and so on. But actually witnessing that has just been astonishing. And I think if if you talk about these sort of national ambitions and you want some evidence that, you know, they're well on the road to achieving those, I think there's actually some clear evidence there. It is, it feels like we are in the middle of a global transition. I mean, that's genuinely what it feels like as somebody that's on the, the inside of that community. It feels like the community is changing and China is becoming a dominant force. The contributors to these conferences, are these typically young people who are coming through or are they older people who may now be focusing more internationally than they were before? No, it's a mixture. So um, I would say I, with respect to the Chinese presence, I think, yes, it's a very young presence. That's very, very clear. But it's the conference itself takes a very, very broad intake of papers from the whole spectrum of, of AI. And for that reason, I think it's a pretty good bellwether of what's going on in the community. What is it that's bringing this about? I mean, what are the Chinese doing that is encouraging their young people to go into research and their researchers to produce more papers for these international conferences? Well, I think what's very interesting about this is that a lot of the drive is not just academic. 
Um, the if you again, if you go back to 1980, the vast majority of the publications at this conference would have been from well, they would have been from the US. There was a tiny presence from outside there, but it would have been from a small clique of US universities like Stanford, Berkeley, MIT, Carnegie Mellon University, who were the kind of the dominant AI universities for a very very long period of time. But what's interesting that you're really seeing now is a huge presence from the kind of companies that we've just heard referred to, like Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. And so the drive is not just coming from academia, it's coming from industry. And there's an ambition on the part of industry to get engaged with this community. And I think that's a recognition that, you know, the key to all of this is skills. And you need a very, very highly skilled workforce to be able to operate successfully in that space. Those companies need to be able to engage with world-leading universities to get that kind of talent. So I think that's been a been an interesting dimension to this, much more industrial presence than you would have seen 30, 35 years ago. And do you think that the collaboration between universities and industry in China is significantly different from what it's like in Britain, say, or the US? The character of the AI drive is interesting because it's because it does have this very clear national backing, the government backing uh, and pushing pushing it. And that can open doors for companies that want to work in the space in a way which isn't really possible, for example, in the UK, because we've got a very different regulatory environment in the UK. Um, and this, I think, is one of the huge advantages that they've got. I mean, I think um, the fact that you've got national backing in and the willingness to make things happen is another kind of quite dramatic aspect of uh, of what we're, what we're witnessing. Xia Rong, for people in China, how would they experience this emphasis from the government on movement towards AI? I think there's one interesting, you may say, uh, that from the, uh, the, the scenarios of the graduate in the area, like 10 years ago, it's comparable with other engineering. But now in China, the uh, the salary, if you could code programming and your work is related about the AI, it is far more higher than any other uh, uh, in other areas. Have they got a lot of universities turning out graduates in computer science and artificial intelligence and so forth? Yeah, particularly in the recent years, there is also a lot of graduate programs and also some new uh, degree programs in this area. The industries in China, would they normally be looking to employ people who have been educated and trained in China? I think for the top tenants, the Chinese people, they don't matter where they're from. They might recruit the international uh, top talent. But generally for uh, the other uh, positions, they would prefer like Chinese graduates because of the culture and the language. One point that is very interesting in the next generation artificial intelligence development plan is that there is a section on remaining weaknesses of China with regards to its AI capabilities. And one of these weaknesses is that there is a shortage of talent uh, when it comes to top level AI research. And China is increasingly looking to attract Chinese that went abroad to study in the US and uh, maybe also went on to work in the US to come back to China. And they're apparently quite successful in that because at the moment there is this AI boom in China. There's a lot of capital which is available. There are very interesting opportunities in the industry. And there are also more and more foreigners who become interested in joining Chinese companies and work there. Of course, it's still a very small uh, number of people or foreigners to work in these Chinese AI companies. But I've met a lot of people, for example, in Shanghai who came for, from, the, uh, from the US, have worked before for a company like Google and now want to be part of this AI boom, which is currently taking place in China. Mike? There's a change in the perception that, for example, China is now seen as a place where, for example, in academia, where there are many opportunities in AI and it's much more attractive for people uh, to uh, uh, to go back to China. For example, you go and do your PhD in Stanford or something like that. Again, I bet 30 years ago, you would probably have tried to get a post in a, in a good US university because the perception was that the opportunities weren't quite the same. Actually, that's 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 changing quite dramatically, uh, and it's becoming a much more attractive, um, a much more attractive option for people. I think who want to pursue a world class academic career in the area. And is it attractive for people who themselves are not from China? I mean, would you get Europeans uh, studying over here or in America and then pursuing careers in China these days? 
Well, I think the truth is at the moment, if you're good in AI, then the world is your oyster. You can go and work anywhere. So China has to vie with everybody else. And there are very, very good options right now in the US, uh, in mainland Europe, uh, in the UK. The UK has done very well in terms of responding to the AI boom. Um, so I think the biggest barrier there is, of course, just language and cultural uh, barrier, but not in. I think the interesting thing is not in terms of the perception of the opportunities that it will give you. That's that's the big change, I think. Right. And Sophie, I'd like to pursue something that Mike mentioned a bit earlier uh, about the regulatory backing in China. And I can imagine that if you are a researcher, it may be that working in a country like China, where the government is fully behind this and able presumably to change the regulatory framework in a way that might be make things easier for researchers than it is in Europe. Would you like to comment on that? I think on the one hand, it might be attractive for researchers to go to China and work in a relatively lax regulatory environment where you might be able to develop a technology, get it out in the market, try it out, see the effects. And maybe afterwards, if the technology has any negative effects, the government might come in and regulate it. So you might have more freedom in uh, the process of developing the technology and implementing it in the market at first. However, I think there are also many researchers, in particular in this AI research community, who think that it's very important that the research they are doing is aligned with ethical values um, and uh, to conduct this research in institutions which are playing or which uh, pay um, attention to the safety of the technology. Um, so what we've seen, for example, in the US, it's quite an, quite an extreme case, but Google has cooperated with the United States Department of Defense on a project, project which is called Project Maven. And Google has been involved in automating the analysis of video data that was uh, collected by drones. And this project wasn't public first, but when it became public, a lot of researchers at Google opposed it. They collected signatures, and in the end, the pressure was so high on Google that it uh, terminated the contract with the U.S. Department of Defense and uh, also Google set up some uh, well, regulatory guidelines or some guiding principles for its research in artificial intelligence. In China, it's possible for products to be released at a relatively early stage, try them out, see how they go, and then deal with the problems afterwards. Whereas I think here, there's much more caution to start with. And you have to show that everything's going to be fine before you release it. Now, that's not necessarily a matter of ethics. It's simply a question of how you line up the risks against possible benefits. Do you think there's a major difference there? Yes, absolutely. I think there is a major difference in the way that we in Europe, for example, look at technological risks and at what stage they need to be regulated um, and anticipated and then to the Chinese approach. So I think this, uh, as I would call, uh, call it real world prototyping approach in China works very, very differently than how we um, well approach these problems in Europe, but I think also in the United States. So there certainly is a big difference. I think there's another aspect to it, which is kind of attitudes to technology. And I think there's a, um, I mean, again, this is just purely anecdotal, but my sense is there's a, a, a much more kind of embracing attitude and a much more excitement about new technology and the cool things that new technology can do. And I think, you know, whereas whereas I think, you know, we we are somewhat more cynical and stand backish a little bit and we laugh at everybody when we first see a, an Apple Watch, you know, with, with, oh, what a piece of junk, you know. And the, whereas I think there's a much more kind of, I say, embracing kind of attitude, go for it, what an exciting thing, what cool things can it do? Um, and so it seems to move differently. So I'll give you just experience from being in China. Um, there's a, an application called WeChat. So have you got WeChat, Peter, on your phone? No. So it's this kind of entire ecosystem developed by Tencent. It's an entire online kind of ecosystem. It does messaging. It does e-commerce. It does social media. It does, it does everything you can think of. And it, it really feels like... You can't get by without it. I'm looking at Sharon. I mean, you know, if you want to do business in China, if you want to pay for anything, you need WeChat on your phone. And it's, I say, it's this kind of this this product which has just been um, kind of embraced um, on a on a national scale. But that national scale means there's more than a billion users of this product. So I asked my daughter, my teenage daughter, who spends her entire life on social media, "Have you ever heard of WeChat?" She and none of her friends had ever even heard of it. But actually, in terms of number of users, it's absolutely up there with Instagram and Facebook and all of the rest of it. I mean, it's a global 
a, a global system in terms of the number of people that use it. Uh, and I say it's just become this ubiquitous thing uh, that now just it seems to everything you do, uh, in, every time you do business in, in China, you need WeChat in order to be able to do it. That's very interesting. So we've got two different aspects of the environment there that you might think would tell in opposite directions. I mean, if you have an environment where testing something out is going to mean you've got a, a billion guinea pigs using it, you might think that would imply more caution from the point of view of regulators. I think it's not necessarily a contradiction. I think Chinese users are also just more accepting of technologies that are not completely perfect by the time they're released. So as Michael has said, I think they're just more excited to try out new technologies and it's not as important as in Europe or in the United States, for example, that by the time these products are released, they are already functioning perfectly. So I think in China, people will try them out, the companies will improve them. It is more a process um, well, and I think this is, yeah, this is very different in, in a European and in a US environment. Is that related to the issue of trust, do you think, that in the West, there isn't the same degree of trust in, should we say, the good intentions of those who are bringing in these applications? And so people are prepared to go for them without worrying that they might be exploited. Whereas here, we seem to be very worried all the time about new things coming in and is our information going to be misused and all that sort of thing. I think Chinese users are definitely looking more at what they get when they use an application and they are willing to trade some privacy or to give data to a company in order to get better results from using a certain app. So for example, there are a lot of Chinese people who use different online shopping platforms and I think they are very keen on getting better recommendations from these systems by providing uh, data uh, well, through the daily usage of these kind of platforms. And I think in Europe, there seems to be a lot of concern about the privacy of users. So users are more and more concerned about what is happening to the data that they are actually providing uh, companies by using certain applications on their smartphones, but also uh, over the internet. And I think this is a little different in China, although there is also an increasing discourse um, and increasing concern about privacy and how this basically uh, fits together with the increasing use of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in particular. Mike, do you get the feeling over the years that our attitude towards innovation has changed in the West, that we're much more cautious and anxious about abuses than we were in the past. What's interesting, particularly about AI, is that what we've seen is a whole new range of opportunities for our rights to be abused. And I think that's what's kind of shocked us and taken us aback. I mean, you know, so the, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, which horrified everybody and rightly so, because it just didn't occur to us that, that our data might be used in that way. I mean, this is a much bigger debate than just the debate about China and AI. I mean, it goes to I mean the fundamental conundrum of living in the digital world, which is that to get the benefits of living in the digital world, to be able to meet your friends online and so on, it seems that you have to give up some aspects of your privacy. You have to hand over your data. And once your data is is in somebody else's hands, you've lost control of it. You don't, you know, whatever regulatory environment you might put on top of that, ultimately you've you've handed it over to somebody else. You know, that goes to the core of our modern world and living in the digital age, that to get those benefits, you have to make some sacrifices. We haven't yet in the West by any means figured out exactly what the final equilibrium there is going to be, you know, what it's going to be in terms of our, our rights to our data and so on. We're just, we are because we are experiencing all these new phenomena, we're finding our way as we go along. I'm afraid I'm a cynic. I feel that actually the genie is out of the bottle in terms of privacy and data, and I don't think we're going to be able to put it back in in the way that we were used to, you know, when I was a child. Or uh, I just don't see that. I mean, I think because the benefits are too big for us and it is just too difficult to kind of regulate on a global scale. I mean, that's just me speaking cynically, but that's how I feel. Zha Rong, in China, do you get the feeling that people are worried about handing over their data? I think people, they are actually willing to trade their privacy data with the convenience or the safety. Just as Sophie was suggesting, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think few people, they have the concerns and indeed some 
it won't happen because of the privacy, but most of people, they are still willing to contribute. It's quite similar to the clinical trial in China. It is quite actually quite easy in China to recruit the volunteers for clinical trials, but in Western countries, because of the regulations, it's actually, you've got a lot of barriers and it's not easy to go. And Mike, if you're right that the genie is out of the bottle, then might we have to learn from China here, living with it? There is a different generational attitude to these things. Um, you know, we've got a generation of kids, including my own kids, who are growing up in the digital age, and not just the digital age, but the online age. They are just routinely sharing and sometimes quite intimate data with each other. And their entire lives are being documented on social media. And we didn't have that. That's a new thing. I mean, you know, th- th- I didn't grow up with that. You didn't grow up with that. And so they are developing just completely different attitudes to, to privacy and data and the ownership of their data to the ones that we had. And not necessarily attitudes that we would be comfortable with. It's now an old story, but when social media first started taking off around about 2005, 2006, there were serious suggestions that you would have the right as an adult to be able to completely change your identity so that you could distance yourself from all the stupid things you did as a teenager, which you documented on social media. I don't know whether that will happen, but I say there are fundamentally different attitudes, I think, that kids have now, people who are growing up in the online world. We've been looking at one aspect in which China might benefit compared to the West, but another that we've alluded to is the sheer numbers. So how does that make a difference in respect of AI research? I think it's a huge, huge, huge national advantage for China. I mean, the population of China is currently about 1.4 billion. It's larger than Europe and the United States combined. 1.4 1.4 billion people in a single legal regulatory system. This means that the companies like the, the big three, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, when they release an application, they can have a user base of a billion people all working with essentially the same language, the same regulatory environment. And the fuel that drives the current AI boom is data. And if you've got a billion users using your app with a single language, you've just got a huge advantage compared to trying to work in your Europe, where uh, any number of different languages and different regulatory environments. So I think this is genuinely a big advantage that companies have uh, in China compared to those that are forming in the West. Is there some particular area where you can see these advantages playing out particularly strongly? For me, the exciting one, not just for China, but globally, is healthcare. So I think this is one area where AI looks set to make a dramatic difference. There are a number of different aspects to this, but one is kind of personalised healthcare. So it's quite common now for people to have wearable technology like an Apple Watch or a Fitbit device, which is monitoring their physiology on a 24-7 basis, continually monitoring aspects of their physiology, their heartbeat. And that data is just fed to the supercomputer in your pocket, which is your smartphone, where AI algorithms can analyse it. And they can do things like, I mean, it kind of sounds trivial, but anybody with children will realise it isn't trivial. They can help with things like dealing with sleep disorders. Uh, They can help you to manage your sleep and understand how you're sleeping and how to sleep better. And AI can help us do this. It's entirely plausible that we will have wristwatch type devices that are going to be able to give us advice on, for example, when we're at risk of a heart attack. I mean, that's actually a genuine possibility with current AI technology. But to make all that work, you need data. You need lots of data. You need lots of data using these products. And you need to be able to monitor these people using these products over a long period of time. And there, I say scale is a huge, huge, huge advantage. So, Xiaorong, in China, do a lot of people wear these devices already? For the health fitness monitoring, it's quite common for some big companies like Huawei. They produce the red band that can monitor your heart rate, your activities, and also like the Xiaomi band. Uh, there are several big stakeholders. It is quite common for, particularly for young people, they wear it to uh, monitor their fitness. And nowadays, also like in the healthcare area. Uh, as mentioned in the uh, development plan, healthcare is a big application area. So when people wear these bands, it's not only that the bands are providing information to the wearer, they're also sending information back to the companies to fuel their research. Yes, I think so, because the devices and also the algorithms need to be reiterated uh, again and again, because the algorithm needs the data to get evolved. 
nowadays there's also the re research direction they combine the personal collected data with the hospital data to get even accurate prediction of their health status. That linkage of private data with hospital data, I can imagine, would be rather difficult here. It is, and there are some examples of it being done successfully here, but there are also some examples where things have they've gone a little bit awry. So a nice example of where I think it's worked well was Google DeepMind, based in London, worked with Moorfields Eye Hospital, and they were extremely rigorous about all the procedures for handling data, for getting data and so on. And it worked tremendously well. And they ended up with a system which could diagnose uh, eye diseases uh, with greater accuracy than a, a typical human expert would be able to. And they were very careful not to claim that this was at product stage, but actually demonstrated that capability. But we have the NHS, which we're very proud of, and rightly so in this country. And because we've had a national healthcare service since the 1940s, We've got a huge amount of data going back. That Most of that data is not remotely in a form that it could be used for machine learning algorithms. But nevertheless, it's, it's a huge potential resource. But using that resource, and in particular handing that resource over to private companies, is an incredibly hot potato in political terms. It's very, very difficult to be able to do anything. So the Moorfields example demonstrates where it can work on a relatively small scale. But to be able to get that value out of NHS data, I think, is probably quite problematic, I think. Sophie. Also, other countries, uh, for example, Germany and France, have realized that it is very important to make large data sets available to companies, but then also to researchers who want to develop applications based on these large amounts of data. But of course, there are very, very big questions that are still open with regard to how can these large amounts of data actually be made available? How can you protect privacy when you make these uh, large data sets available? And in what kind of form? So what kind of ways do countries such as Germany and France find to structure these data and to label it so that it's becoming accessible to people who want to use that for research purposes? I think China has one more advantage when it comes to using these large amounts of data. As Michael has alluded to, this data is very difficult to use for machine learning when it's just in a raw form. So it needs to be structured and it needs to be labeled. For example, if we have images as a source of data, then this is only really useful for machine learning algorithms if these images are labeled. So if there is basically somebody who says this is a tree, this is a car, this is a house, and so on and so forth. And what is currently happening in China is that there is a new industry developing around these applications where you basically have firms that offer a service of labeling all this data for you because there is still quite a um, there are quite low wages in China there is the possibility to actually have people label these images or uh, also other sources of data and I think this is a huge advantage in actually making this data usable for machine learning applications. So that sounds like a wonderful context for them because not only do they have lots of data coming in, they've also got the possibility where you need a human to identify things in the data in order to train the algorithms. They've got a huge source of cheap labour. Well, I mean, you might not need this on the long term. So hopefully at some point sure. you might not need a human anymore who's actually labeling this data, but hopefully it's also possible to automate this and so at some point. And I think it is going to be possible. But for the moment, I think the availability of cheap labor is an advantage when you really want to make uh, use of, of these large amounts of data. Yes. Presumably in healthcare in particular, it's actually rather important to get data sets that are from the right population, because if we, say, try to manage healthcare in Western Europe on the basis of data that comes from China, their healthcare issues are going to be somewhat different from ours. Yes, exactly. And I also think that something that is very important to keep in mind is that the healthcare systems in European countries, for example, have a really high standard. Um, I think in certain areas, definitely even a higher standard than in China. And so these healthcare systems produce very, very valuable data that could be used to develop further applications and also to develop more personalized uh, ways of healthcare. So I think there it is certainly very important to uh, think about how to make this available to researchers. Mike, can you give us a feel for how AI research and machine learning in particular is going on in the rest of the world compared with China? Is China already overtaking us? Historically, uh, 
it was all about the US. AI really started in the US. Outside the US, the UK, I think it's fair to say, was 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 quite genuinely um, the number two country. If you go back just sort of 20 years, then I think there's been a much broadening out uh, onto onto mainland Europe, for example, uh, Australia, Canada also became global powers. But actually, all the big innovations, all the big headline systems in AI until very recently originated in the United States. So, you know, the IBM Watson system, Deep Blue that beat Gary Kasparov back in the 1990s, the driverless car, the grand challenge in 2005 that heralded the era of driverless cars, that was Stanford University, and so on and so on and so on. So the really big developments until very recently all came out of the US. And for the moment, at least, the bulk of the new developments are... But what is different is the research power base uh, in terms of global quality research power base. That's where China is is winning. I mean, just in terms of its research power, its muscle in this area. One could go back and talk about the experience in the 1980s of Japan. You will remember there was a big move in Japan in the 1980s. And the sense was that Japan was very successful at making products and businesses, but not necessarily so successful at innovating. And uh, in particular, in the area of computer software and, and computer technology. So there was a massive national investment in Japan in what was called the fifth generation computer project. They bet on the wrong technologies, basically. And one one view of the fifth generation computer project was that it was in some sense a failure, that it didn't deliver the global advantage that Japan had hoped for. But Actually, when I talk to colleagues in Japan, their view is that what it did is it created Japan as a player on the international stage in terms of computing and computer science uh, research. So it didn't deliver what I think they wanted, but actually it delivered something. So uh, is AI the the right technology to bet on? I think it's a pretty good bet right now for, for China. That research muscle, even if you can't innovate, that research muscle, that research power base is going to deliver. And would it be fair to say that we live in an age at the moment where big developments in AI for the next decade or two, an awful lot of them are going to come not from major research innovations, but rather applications of a technology that's already there, namely deep learning, combined with huge amounts of data and computing power? Yes, I think that's, I would say that I think that's, that's fair to say. I mean, we've got this new technology and what's exciting at the moment is everybody discovering all the amazing things that you can do with it. And, and this is, this is why everybody's so excited right now about, uh, about deep learning and machine learning. And so I think there's an element of truth to that. If you can just, if you can just use these technologies, then actually you've, you've got great scope using them in an imaginative way. Then you've got great scope to be able to create new products and services and new businesses. And I think that's that's what we're going to see for the next decade. Xiao Rong, looking to the future, I would have thought if we've got Chinese universities turning out lots of very well-trained young people, we've got industry and government giving people lots of opportunities for developing their skills, for well-paid jobs, uh, thinking about research applications of AI. In 10, 20 years time, there's going to be a huge impetus to keep going either using this technology or discovering new ones. How do you see it changing China? Well, I think this is uh, currently China have big advantages uh, in the application or the implication of the AI, but not the discoveries or the basic theories. But through this plan, China have the goal first like, to lead in, in the area of application. And then it is possible to catch up uh, from the theoretical uh, discoveries. Do their plans distinguish quite clearly between applications and the theoretical scientific innovation? Yes, I think so. So currently, I think China, uh, the government's realize admit that the Chinese is not good at the original result of the AI uh, series. Um, but for the applications, just uh, as Mike mentioned, the data is a huge advantage. And also the ecosystem is really good, the market, the applications, etc. But they are keeping in mind that the goal is all kinds from the theory to the application. Mike, for over the next 20 to 30 years, what do you think the implications will be of what's going on in China now? Well, I think 
uh, we have to take the, the AI story as just part of a much bigger picture about the changes in China. I mean, any any statistic that you throw out about China is remarkable. But I mean, here's just the, the most remarkable one that I found when I was just doing research for this. So over the last 30 years, China's had an average 16% year on year growth in GDP, 16% year on year for the last 30 years. It is at right now, by standard measures, it seems to be the second largest economy in the world. But actually, by some measures, it's the largest. Um, if we just continue this trajectory, and the trajectory that I've witnessed as an AI researcher of the growth of, of Chinese AI, and just project that even a decade into the future, if we just get that growth continuing a decade into the future, then actually there's good, it's a fundamental shift in the nature of, 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 of our world. China will have the biggest economy in the world. It will have uh, a, a research base, not just in AI, but a research base generally that is the largest in the world. And it's uh, you just have to project that growth a few years into the future. But AI is only part of the story, and it's part of the story of China over the last 30 years opening up, engaging with the West, engaging with business, really pushing business and developing business and products. And I think we're going to see an awful lot more of that. So in, you know, my grandchildren will have heard of Tencent and Baidu and Alibaba, even if my kids right now haven't, that will be a much more everyday presence in our lives. So I say, I think we are, we're in a, a kind of a unique period similar to the growth of the US in the 20th century and the way that the US became, by the second half of the 20th century, became the, the dominant geopolitical force in the world. It's very hard not to see that based on any kind of statistics that you look at uh, uh, about China. Thank you. Sophie? Yeah, I think, I mean, at the moment, we still see that the US is a leader as measured by many artificial intelligence indicators, for example, when it comes to basic research, or when it comes to hardware. But China's ambitions should certainly not be underestimated in this space, given the considerable state support for the advancement and use of national and international AI resources, and also the enthusiasm of the Chinese population. I think what is very important is to still find a way to cooperate with China on many issues, um, especially when it comes to risks that will emerge from the development of artificial intelligence. We were talking about safety, we were talking about ethics question, and China will certainly play a very, very important role in steering the development, but also the uh, implementation of these technologies across a number of fields. So I think it's very important to find ways for European countries and also for the United States to uh, cooperate with China, for example, in uh, research and development on, and to make sure that, I mean, at the moment, we're often talking about an AI race between China and the United States developing. And I think it's very important to try to make sure that this narrative is not becoming dominant and that countries are, for instance, willing to uh, compromise safety just for having a first mover advantage in a particular field, be it economics, but also the military, for example. So I think this is very important to keep in mind. So it's seen more as a cooperative enterprise than a competitive one. Well, I think at the moment it is predominantly framed as a competitive enterprise and I think it's also framed as a zero-sum game and I think this is really going in the wrong direction. I think it's very important to communicate that different countries can definitely benefit from this development and that there are many ways of cooperating and I think decision makers should put more effort into finding these areas where there can be fruitful cooperation with China. I mean, on the side of the United States, for example, we've seen, especially over the last year, there are a lot of initiatives that were aiming at sort of isolating the US economy in particular also with a focus on artificial intelligence. So by now we have a more strict review procedure for foreign direct investments from various countries into the United States in high-tech industries, including artificial intelligence. Now the Commerce Department is also thinking about expanding its export controls so that they cover various AI technologies. And I think it's very important to keep in mind really where countries can benefit from open trade in these areas, from exchange in science, and that countries can really benefit from this development and not uh, having it framed as a zero-sum game. Xiaorong, the Chinese government has announced this plan of getting best in the world in AI, becoming an absolute world leader. 
does that have a big impact on the people in China, the way they think about AI, the way they plan for the future? Yes, I think uh, uh, absolutely. The plan is a very good beginning for the whole countries to get to know more about the technology and to develop the technology. And more importantly, uh, actually, this is a part of the uh, Chinese government plan to develop the innov- science and technology innovation. And after 30 years through this plan, I can see the bright future this technology can bring for the China. Well, that's an excellent point to finish on. Thank you very much. That's been a very interesting discussion. I'd heard a lot of talk recently about China's ambitions in AI, and I'd like to thank Mike, Xiaorong, and Sophie Charlotte for helping me to find out more. And my thanks to you for listening. We're nearly at the end of our first series of Future Makers, and I'd love to know what you think of the show. Why not leave a review and let me know which episodes you enjoyed most? In the final episode of our series, we'll highlight a few of the key themes that have emerged and raise some interesting new questions with a couple of special guests. I'm Peter Millikan, and you've been listening to Future Makers. Hi there, Future Makers listeners. Hello. Stephen Ben here from the production team, just popping in to say that we hope you're enjoying listening to the show as much as we enjoy making it. The episode you've just listened to has been kindly sponsored by the Exponential View podcast. In just a moment, its host and creator, Azim Azar, will talk to you about what you can expect from his excellent show. After listening, why not give Future Makers a review? It's your chance to help steer the debate, and we really enjoy reading every one. From politics and culture to business and the household, technology is transforming every aspect of our society. But the quality of debate around it isn't keeping pace with its exponential progress. And in order to shape technology for our own benefit, we need to be aware of how it's evolving. And that's the goal of the Exponential View podcast. Join me, Azim Azar, for weekly conversations with entrepreneurs, policymakers, technologists and leading academics as we discuss the forces shaping our future. From artificial intelligence and the future of work to cybersecurity and the role of the state in innovation. Find the Exponential View podcast at www.exponentialview.co slash podcast or just search for Exponential View on your favorite podcasting platform.